Well, uh, good morning. Uh, first, uh, shakran jazilan uh, to the organizers and to the Sheikh Hamdan Award uh, for the great privilege and honor of being here with you this morning. Um, let's see if I can make this work. Let's see, this should make it advance, maybe. There we go. Um, it's been a great pleasure uh, to meet and make so many new friends. And I sincerely hope that many of these friendships will be enduring ones, uh, inshallah. So a uh, part of what I will tell you about today is technology that is commercially licensed uh, to exact sciences. All right, let's see what is happening. Um, yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to show you a picture of me shoveling snow just before I got on the plane to come here, but it didn't, it didn't project. Um, but I am from Cleveland, and uh, things that are well known uh, about Cleveland, uh, we have a uh, wonderful symphony orchestra that is world famous. We have the I Am Pi Designed Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for people who like their music a little bit more recent. And of course, we have LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are the reigning uh, NBA champions. We also have the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And this is a picture of the medical center complex. And this is the Seidman Cancer Center, where my patients are cared for, and the Wolstein Research Building, where my laboratory is. So the story I'm going to tell you about began over two decades ago with a patient uh, who I saw in clinic. He was a 33-year-old accountant who was dying of metastatic colon cancer. And on speaking with him, I learned that his father had died young of metastatic colon cancer. His grandfather had died young of metastatic colon cancer. And we recognized that this family looked like families that Henry Lynch had described and that were being loosely categorized as Lynch syndrome, but we didn't know what Lynch syndrome was. So we began to make cell lines from this patient's tumors as well as the tumors of other patients that we could discover. And we teamed up with Bert Vogelstein to try to understand the genetic basis of the disease. Now, there was a very early hint that the problem in Lynch syndrome had something to do with DNA repair. And that hint was, if you just did standard classic DNA fingerprinting, so these are, oops, these are studies where you use what are called microsatellites. Uh, they just have different size sequences in different people. So here's someone's paternal allele, their maternal allele. Normally, this DNA fingerprint is the same in all of the tissues uh, across the human body, as well as in cancers that develop in those tissues. The surprise was that in patients with Lynch syndrome, the DNA fingerprint actually changed. The physical size of these DNA sequences became different in the tumor uh, compared to what the patient had been born with, suggesting there was some problem in maintaining the integrity of these DNA sequences in the microsatellites. Indeed, uh, the team that Bert Vogelstein led was able to show that the inherited defect in Lynch syndrome was due to errors that disrupted a DNA repair machine called DNA mismatch repair, which acts like a DNA spell checker. It goes along the DNA, and when one of the strands slips and makes a bubble, it fixes it. Now, this DNA machinery has many, many parts. The family that we discovered in Cleveland had been born with a defect in the MSH2 gene, uh, part of the mismatch repair machine. And most other families were defective either in MSH2 or in the MLH1 component of the mechanism. So starting with this family, I've really spent the last two decades trying to understand what happens when patients who are born with a Lynch syndrome defect develop colon cancer. What can we learn from that process? And I'm going to share with you four lessons that we've learned from these studies. Uh, the first is that that DNA methylation can cause cancer. 
The second is that you can use DNA methylation as a biomarker to detect cancers. The third is that TGF-beta is a key tumor suppressor that prevents the development of colon and other GI cancers. And the last is that TGF-beta works by turning on and off another gene, 15 prostaglandin dehydrogenase. It acts as a tumor suppressor, but can also act as a regulator of the ability of tissues to heal themselves after injury. So let me go through how we made these observations. The first question, of course, was patients with Lynch syndrome were born with a defect in this DNA mismatch repair mechanism, and it gave them this instability called microsatellite instability of their DNA. But we also found that about 15 percent of patients with colon cancer showed the same defect in microsatellite instability, but they didn't have Lynch syndrome. No one in their family had had colon cancer before. And the question was, what was the explanation for these Lynch-like patients that didn't have a family history of the disease? We were one of uh, three laboratories that simultaneously hit on the answer to this question, and it involved the MLH1 component of the DNA repair machine. Now, patients in, with Lynch syndrome could be born with one defective copy of the MLH1 component, and when one of their cells by accident lost the remaining good copy, they now were totally deficient from DNA repair. They developed colon cancer. What we found was that the 15 percent of patients who had Lynch-like syndrome without having Lynch were also damaging MLH1 genes, but they were doing it by a chemical modification of the DNA called DNA methylation. They were physically adding methyl groups onto the region of the DNA that turns the MLH1 gene on and off. So they were functionally inactive for being able to make the MLH1 product. This discovery became part of the clinical algorithm by which patients with colon cancer are now evaluated. So when patients in our hospital come in with colon cancer, they have immunohistochemistry to examine the status of their DNA repair mechanism. If all of the components, MLH1 and MSH2 and the other components of the DNA repair machine are there, then they don't have Lynch. If one of the components is missing, then they do have a, a DNA repair defective kind of colon cancer, and it may be Lynch. And so now one looks specifically at the staining for the MLH1 component of the machinery. If it's present, then they had a defect in MSH2 and they have Lynch. And that means you then have to sequence MSH2, find the mutation, and test all of their siblings and their children in order to begin to prevent the development of early onset colon cancers in the family. If MLH1 is missing, then it gets a little more complicated. The next test is the DNA methylation test that we invented. Now, if the DNA methylation is present, then this is the sporadic mimic of Lynch, and the family has no risk. But if the DNA methylation is absent, then again, their MLH1 was destroyed by an inherited mutation, and the family has Lynch syndrome and needs to be evaluated genetically. We wondered if this was a one-time event or whether DNA methylation was important in other familial-type cancers, and we turned our attention to families that inherited diffuse gastric cancer, so-called hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Now, in these families, the genetic defect is an inherited mutation in the gene that encodes for E. cadherin, a protein that causes cells to adhere to one another. Now, they inherit one damaged copy of that gene, but they can get along for a while because they have inherited a second good copy of the gene. So if you stain the stomach for these individuals for E. cadherin, you can see this in brown you see the normal presence of E. cadherin in the normal stomach. But then something happens to this normal copy, and now these very diffuse and highly aggressive tumors develop, and they're missing E. cadherin. The only E. cadherin left is in these two normal gastric pits that are in the center of the tumor. And we asked, how is this second good copy inactivated in a way that causes these tumors? Well, we found in half of the cases the second copy acquires another mutation, an accident of life that destroys the second gene. But in the other half of tumors that arise in these families, 
The second copy is still there in the genome. It's perfectly normal for DNA sequence. But again, it's been altered by the acquisition of this DNA methylation. And this now was the conviction, gave us the conviction that DNA methylation was a central mechanism that was involved in the development of human cancers. And so we wondered if we might be able to use DNA methylation to help detect the presence of human cancers. Now, this is a colonoscopy exam. I'm a medical oncologist, so I don't exactly know how to do these, but I get pictures. Um, and here you see the detection of a colon cancer. And certainly colonoscopy can detect colon cancers, but it's been a very frustrating uh, method. Um, most patients, and even in the U.S. where there's good insurance coverage, don't go for colonoscopies. And colon cancer remains the second leading cause of, colon, of cancer death in the United States. So we wondered whether you could use DNA methylation to detect the presence of cancer. And shortly after identifying that you had MLH1 methylation, we, in developing this DNA test, you see here are these bands that show that it's present in the tumor, we began to collect blood from colon cancer patients and asked, could we find this methylated DNA in the blood? And this was 15 years ago. And we were able to be the first laboratory to show that you could detect circulating methylated DNA in the presence of colon cancer patients using MLH1 as the fish, that's the bait that we were using. Now the problem was, back 15 years ago, we could only detect the methylation in the presence of patients with metastatic disease with a lot of this abnormal DNA in their blood. So we realized we had to do better. We needed two things. We needed a gene that was methylated in a lot more patients than the patients with Lynch-like syndrome, and we needed a more sensitive way to detect that DNA. So we went through a genome-wide screen to look for all of the regions in the human genome that might get methylated in cancer, and we wound up in an unexpected place. This is the first exon of the vimentin gene, and these little yellow balls indicate a set of residues in the DNA that are unmethylated in the normal colon but they get targeted for this methylation modification in colon cancers. We developed a little DNA test to pick up this methyl signature. You can see it's here in the tumors, but not the normal. Ah, thank you. And we found that it was present in 80% of colon cancers making it the most frequent modification of DNA that was then known for colon cancers. We worked with the Vogelstein Laboratory, our longtime collaborators, to develop a method to detect one molecule of DNA in two mils of blood. And we showed that this method when it could pick up half of patients with early stage colon cancer. So depending on how you looked, either the glass was half empty or the glass was half full. But we realized what this told us was that the blood is too far away from the tumor to always pick up small tumors. And we had to get closer to the tumor. However, we did compare these results with CEA, the standard marker that is used for colon cancer detection. And we found that the presence of the abnormal DNA in the blood was four times better than CEA. So we think this method probably should replace CEA for monitoring colon cancer patients after surgery but it was too far away from the tumor to use to screen patients. So we thought, how can we get closer to tumors in the colon? And so we began to collect stool from patients with colon cancer and ask if instead of testing for blood in the stool as a marker for tumors, we test for abnormal DNA, would that work? And we found that we could detect these abnormal methylated DNAs in feces from patients with cancers. And this test could pick up 85% of early stage colon cancers. This test became developed as a commercial test in the United States. It was called ColoSure. It was the first DNA-based test for detecting uh, colon cancers. And it was the predecessor to the second generation test, which is called ColoGuard, that's now been approved by the FDA. But we were frustrated still because detecting, stool in, detecting DNA in stool, although we could detect early colon cancers, it still wasn't as good as a colonoscopy because we couldn't detect adenomas. So we realized to detect the premalignant lesions that you really want to detect if you're going to stop colon cancer, you have to get right on top of the lesion. And we wondered, is there a place in the gut where this kind of technology could really have that kind of impact? And we realized there was. 
and it's further up the GI tract. It's in the esophagus. Now, esophageal adenocarcinoma has been an epidemic in the United States. It's increased over sevenfold over the last three decades, and it now kills more Americans than ovarian cancer. And esophageal adenocarcinoma develops right here at the gastroesophageal junction, and it has a well-defined precursor lesion, Barrett's esophagus, where the squamous esophagus is replaced by an adenomatous metaplasia. We wondered if methylated vimentin might be a marker of this change also. And when we looked at biopsies, much to our pleasure, we found that methylated vimentin could pick up 90% of Barrett's esophagus. It was even more sensitive for early changes in the esophagus than it is in the colon. So we teamed up with our endoscopy colleagues, and we asked, could you do molecular cytology? Could you pass a little cytology brush into the esophagus, scrape the GE junction, and then test the DNA from that for methylated vimentin? And indeed, we could. We detected no methylated vimentin DNA in the GE junctions of normal individuals, but patients with Barrett's or the esophageal adenocarcinoma were positive 90% of the time. We've now engineered a little device that you can swallow that will brush the GE junction. And we have a clinical trial ongoing in Cleveland. We've so far enrolled 150 individuals, and we're seeing over 90% sensitivity with this molecular cytology approach for detecting these early Barrett changes. So our patient with Lynch syndrome took us through a very long journey all the way up to the esophagus. But if we go back to him for a second, there was one huge question that we hadn't yet come to grips with, which is if you lose DNA mismatch repair, either by mutation or by methylation, so you have DNA instability, why do you get colon cancer, not lung cancer, not leukemia? We had a hunch, and the hunch was perhaps there were certain genes that needed this DNA mismatch repair mechanism in order to maintain the integrity of the gene itself. And we went looking for those kind of genes, and we got lucky because our hunch proved out to be correct. And we found a gene. It was the type 2 TGF beta receptor. It acts as an antenna on the surface of cells in the colon to tell them that TGF beta is present, and that's a signal for cells in the normal colon to die and to slough off into the colon lumen. There's an unusual sequence in the TGF beta receptor. It's a 10 base pair repeat of the same DNA base adenine. And if you try to say A, 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 and try to do it exactly 10 times, you'll find it's not easy. And it's not easy for the DNA repair machinery either, which is why this gene needs DNA repair. We found that in patients with mismatch repair deficiency, that 10 base pair sequence became a hotspot for DNA mutations. And those mutations destroyed the receptors. They always cut off the part of the receptor that would be inside the cell, telling the cell that TGF beta was present. So 100% of colon cancers with DNA mismatch repair deficiency have these mutations. That was a eureka moment for us because it answered so many questions. First, it was the first genetic proof that this gene, TGF beta receptor 2, was a tumor suppressor. We didn't know that before. By implication, it also told us that the whole TGF beta pathway would be a tumor suppressor involved in human cancers. And it also gave us the machine that explained why patients with Lynch syndrome develop colon cancer. Because if you miss the DNA repair mechanism that you lose in Lynch syndrome, you now are very, very good at destroying the TGF beta receptor gene. It was consistent with studies we had already done that I had mentioned, where we showed that if you added TGF beta to normal colon cells, you could kill them. This is the nuclei of those cells degenerating after being exposed to TGF beta, whereas colon cancers were always resistant. When we first made this observation, we had a lot of trouble publishing it because all the journals said, you don't know how it happens. And our answer then was, if we knew how it happens, we'd be sending this to a better journal. So when we did find out how it happened, we were very gratified that science published um, that TGF beta receptors were mutated in colon cancer. We wondered, where do the TGF beta receptors work? And we looked at patients with Lynch syndrome, and we looked at their adenomas, or adenomas with high-grade dysplasia, or adenomas that had foci of invasive cancer, 
We looked for these pathognomonic mutations in TGS-beta receptors. If the receptor was okay, we put a green dot. And if it had been damaged, we put a red dot. And you can see right here where the red dots are. They're right here in these adenomas with high-grade dysplasia or these adenomas with invasive cancer. So TGF-beta receptors act as a break that prevent adenomas from becoming, frankly, invasive cancers. So we were beginning to build up a diagram. We understood that if you lose DNA mismatch repair, that very effectively targets this sequence right here in TGF-beta receptors for mutation. We wondered, though, if that might be just the tip of the iceberg. And what we found was that it was, because when we went back and looked at patients who had normal DNA mismatch repair, we showed they still targeted TGF-beta receptors for inactivation. It's just it was harder to find because they didn't have a hot spot. In these patients, the mutations were scattered throughout the gene, but they always inactivated its function. So about a third of all patients with colon cancer have mutations that inactivate TGF-beta receptors. 15% of them have microsatellite unstable colon cancers, inactivate the receptor here, and the other 15% don't have microsatellite instability, but they still inactivate TGF-beta receptors. And this too is the tip of the iceberg, because when we teamed up with our friends in the Vogelstein laboratory to say, what about the patients in whom the TGF-beta receptors are wild type? We found they frequently had mutations in SMADs, which are genes that connect the TGF-beta receptor to the nucleus, and so are part of the same signaling pathway. Well, we made those observations some years ago, but in 2006, we were part of the international team, again, led by Bert, um, that sequenced the colon cancer, entire colon cancer genome. That was the first cancer genome to be sequenced. And we summarized the findings of that work in a review in science which said there are 12 key pathways that are targeted for mutation to get human tumors. And you notice that our observations stood the test of time, because a decade later with whole genome sequencing, TGF-beta again emerged as one of the key tumor suppressor pathways that are targeted for mutations in cancer. So we wondered, why is this pathway so important? What could be downstream of TGF-beta signaling that the GI tract cared about so much that it was always inactivating this pathway. And to try to ask, how does it work? The experiment we did was to take some colon cells and to add TGF-beta to them and to use DNA microarray technology to say, what are all the genes that get turned on? And then we added a bunch of colon cancers and used the same technology to say, when you become a colon cancer, what genes do you turn off? And so we could now ask a very simple question. Are there any genes that TGF-beta turns on that cancers promptly turn off? And when we did that, one gene jumped off the page at us because TGF-beta turned it on by over a factor of 10, and colon cancers absolutely turned it off. And the gene was called 15 borostaglandin dehydrogenase. I'm going to call it 15 PGDH for short. And we'd never heard of it. There were no papers that said this gene had anything to do with cancer whatsoever. But this genetic experiment suggested to us it had to be important in GI cancers. And so we asked, what is 15 prostaglandin dehydrogenase? And we found it was an enzyme. And what that enzyme does is work on prostaglandins. Here is prostaglandin E2, PGE2. And it oxidizes up this hydroxyl group to a keto group. And when that happens, PGE2 is now inactive. It can no longer be pro-inflammatory. So PGDH is, in a sense, anti-inflammatory by destroying PGE2. And now things started to make a little more sense, because the role of PGE2 inflammation in colon cancer was well understood. The gene that makes PGE2, COX2, was known to be highly turned on in many colon cancers, elevating prostaglandin E2. And it was understood that prostaglandin E2 could drive growth, cell migration, cell survival, new blood vessel formation all things that cancers care about. So our thought was perhaps PGDH is the wastebasket that normally keeps this pathway turned off. That instead of allowing the PGE2 to go forward and drive inflammation, it sweeps it away into a trash can molecularly. 
So we asked if that might be right. And the first question was, well, where is the PGDH coming from in the colon? And this was immunostaining showing that the PGDH is present on the luminal surface of the colonic crypts, where these cells are already poised to undergo de cell death and be sloughed into the colon lumen. If we looked at colon cancers, the PGDH was gone. Now that was a correlative argument, but we were quickly able to take colon cancer cells that had lost PGDH and using gene transfer, put it back in, turning the enzyme activity back on. We didn't do a very good job of turning it back on. We only got about half as much enzyme activity as was present in the normal colon. But that 50% turn on was enough because when we put these cells into mice, the colon cancer cells could rapidly grow and form tumors. The cells where we had turned PGDH back on could not. Or if they formed tumors late, it was because they had lost the gene we had put back in. So this told us PGDH could act as a tumor suppressor, but it didn't tell us how important that tumor suppression is. And so we turned to the PGDH knockout mouse, a mouse which is missing both genes for PGDH. Uh, the good news was there was a mouse. The bad news was there was a mouse. <laughs> it looked pretty healthy. Um, but we found that if we took this mouse and treated it with a carcinogen as oxymethane, if we took a wild-type mouse and treated it with that carcinogen, the colon was fine. If we took our PGDH knockout mouse, the colon developed tumors. And you could count those tumors, and there were either one or two or three tumors in the knockout mice. And they were a mixture of adenomas and adenomas with carcinoma in situ. Um, we wanted to be sure we were right, because when you do experiments giving carcinogens in mice, you always have to worry that the effects you're seeing might have something to do with the chemistry of the carcinogen. So we tried a second kind of mouse, a mouse that has a mutation in the APC gene that is involved in human colon cancer. And this is a funny mouse. Even though the APC gene causes human colon polyps, in the mouse, the colon is fine. But if you combine this APC mutation with loss of PGDH, now you can see multiple tumors again in the colon. And here was the graph showing a seven or eight fold increase in colon cancer development when we took away PGDH. So we knew now that PGDH really was effective as a colon cancer suppressor. We wondered how it worked. And the, the clue is if you look very shortly after you give a carcinogen and compare a mouse that has PGDH with one that doesn't, what you can see is that in the carcinogen-resistant mouse, what the carcinogen is inducing is small hyperplastic polyps. In the PGDH-deficient mouse, what you see are small adenomas with high-grade dysplasia. Now, that's what my pathologist said. I always trust my pathologist, but journals don't. So to prove that our pathologist was right, we stained these lesions with markers for cell proliferation. You can see hyperplastic lesions don't proliferate adenomatous lesions with dysplasia proliferate all the way to the surface of the lesion. And we asked what was driving this proliferation, and we found it was another oncogene called cyclin D1, which is turned on in these uh, adenomatous lesions in the PGDH deficient mouse, but not in the wild type mouse. And here you see now, if one quantitates this data, the large increase in dysplasia proliferation <coughs> and cyclin D1 in the crypts of the knockout mouse, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, <coughs> that'd be great, ah, thank you. So we were beginning to develop a pathway in which cyclooxygenase 2 converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. That drives colon neoplasia. And now we knew that it works by acting on an initiated cell where it can turn on cyclin D1 and proliferation. And that what turns this pathway off is PGDH normally. And that what's controlling PGDH is TGF beta. So when you put the figure all together, what we now realized was that TGF beta is an anti inflammatory. It works to block this oncogenic pathway that's driven by COX 2 and prostaglandins. Now, this made a lot of sense biologically because in the United States and in England and other countries, 
drugs that can inhibit COX-2, inhibit the development of prostaglandins like aspirin and salicoxib, were in clinical trial to see if they could prevent colon cancer, and indeed they can. Aspirin and salicoxib can reduce colon cancer rates by about a third when taken for over a decade. So the question for us was, was this just interesting biology, or was it possible that somehow the PGDH and the salicoxib might be talking to each other? And we thought we should use our mice to ask that question. So here's a mouse given carcinogen and getting colon tumors. And here is the same matched mouse where we've given him salicoxib. And indeed, the salicoxib prevents the development of the colon tumors. Now, here's the mouse without PGDH. It, of course, gets a lot more colon tumors. That's consistent with what we already knew. And now the question was, what happens when you give salicoxib to the mouse without PGDH? And I think you can see the answer. Without PGDH, the salicoxib doesn't work. It turns out the anti-colon cancer, the colon cancer prevention of NSAID type drugs, always had a hidden partner. And that partner was the activity of PGDH itself. Well, that was a mouse. The question was, did this have anything to do with our patients? And Monica Bertinoli at Harvard had led a clinical study of giving salicoxib to patients with high-risk adenomas. And she graciously sent all of the biopsies that she had from those patients to us. And each of these little black tick marks is the amount of colon PGDH that we measured in those different patients. And we were very surprised because you can see there's a huge range in the human population between people who have low PGDH in their colon and people who have high PGDH. Here's the average. And now we added some clinical data. Here were the patients that were resistant to salicoxib. While they were taking the drug, they kept developing colon adenomas, one adenoma or three adenomas or four adenomas. And you can see all of them are low in PGDH. Now, it's a very small clinical trial, but it looked just like the mice. So we thought maybe it's right, and we should look for a larger clinical trial where we could really prove this biology was real. And we turned to our friends, Andy Chan's group at the Harvard School of Public Health, where they were in charge of the nurse's health study and the health professional's follow-up study. This is one of the largest cohort studies in the United States that had shown the association of aspirin use with prevention of colon cancer. And so Andy um, sent, actually, Suji Ogino, Andy's pathologist, who had trained in my lab, so we had an inside connection, sent us blocks from the patients on this study. And in my laboratory, we measured the amount of PGDH in those blocks. And half of the patients, we said, had high PGDH in their colon. They had above average PGDH. And when we looked in those individuals, aspirin was very, very effective. People who took aspirin had only half the risk of developing colon cancer as people who did not. This was the most effective prevention of colon cancer with aspirin that had been observed. But when we looked at the other half of the participants in the study, the ones where PGDH was below average, now we saw aspirin had no effect whatsoever. And this was statistically significant. And it uh, was published now 18 months ago in Science Translational Medicine. And we think it's a highly timely observation because it directly addresses what has been an important debate in prevention in the US, which is who should take aspirin for prevention of colon cancer. And some of you may know that a year ago, the US Prevention Task Force said, aspirin is great for preventing colon cancer. If you're already taking it for your heart, please keep taking it. Because they had no idea who to recommend it to to prevent colon cancer. And now we think we know. And we're hoping that we can bring this forward for exactly that use in the clinic. But there was, with all observations, a new question that was embedded in the observation. And that was, here are a group of patients. Here's the level of PGDH. And some people are very high, and some people are very low. And I've just spent a few minutes telling you having high PGDH is good for you. So why should there be human beings with low PGDH? Usually when you see that, it means you've only got half the story. And some of you in this room who are of age similar to me will remember a day when we used to give Cytotech, PGDH mimetic to heal gastric ulcers. I'm sorry, PGE2 mimetic to heal gastric ulcers. So we thought perhaps having low PGDH and high PGE2 
might be good if you're in a situation where your gut might be ulcerating. And we used our mice to ask that question. Could there be an advantage of having low PGDH? So this is a mouse given an agent that induces a colitis syndrome. So it's called DSS. And here you can see this is a mouse colonoscopy done by Fabio Cominelli's group at Case. Here's the ulcer uh, in the colonoscope. Here it is under the microscope. If you take a normal mouse and give it DSS, about 9% of its colon will ulcerate. If you take a mouse that doesn't have PGDH, the colon doesn't ulcerate at all. If you look under the microscope, in the normal mouse, the crypts are heavily destroyed. In the mouse that doesn't have PGDH, the crypts look totally normal. So in the absence of PGDH, mice are highly resistant to developing colitis type of injury. This is clinically evident in the mouse. The normal mouse given DSS gets sick and loses weight. The mouse that doesn't have PGDH continues to gain weight. The mouse that is normal develops diarrhea with blood uh, detectable in the feces. The mouse that doesn't have PGDH is fine. So how is PGDH protecting from colitis? Well, here is a picture of the crypts of the mouse in green. And the little red dots are the cells at the base of the crypt, the tissue stem cells that you heard about from Dave Cuvison, that are dividing and maintaining the health of the crypt. They're renewing the crypt every day. When you give DSS to a mouse, you lose most of those dividing cells. And that's why the crypt will disappear and an ulcer will form. If you don't have PGDH and you injure the mucosa with DSS, you start out with pretty much the same number of dividing cells as the normal mouse, but after injury, you can see this huge burst of dividing cells now in the crypt. So PGDH turns out to be a regulator of the response of tissue stem cells to tissue damage. When you turn it off, the stem cells respond to damage much, much more robustly and allow ulcers to heal or not to form. This is the quantitation of that. Here you can see the difference in the number of dividing stem cells in the mouse without PGDH versus with PGDH after a week of DSS. We wondered if this only was true in the colon. So we turned to another GI model, that of the liver. Now the liver is a highly regenerative organ, but we had a GI surgeon in the lab. Surgeons love to cut. So he took the mouse liver and he cut out two thirds of it and then waited 10 days. And when you do that, of course, the liver remnant can hypertrophy and regenerate the liver. And then he compared mice that were normal for PGDH or mice lacking PGDH and weighed how much liver grew back. And you can see the mouse that is missing PGDH regenerates its liver much faster. We think the ancient Greeks knew about this and that's what explains the legend of Prometheus. So the question was, could we use this medicinally? If turning off PGDH helps heal tissues, could we develop a drug that would turn off PGDH? And we developed a genetic screen to look for such a drug. We teamed up with colleagues at UT Southwestern in Dallas. We looked at a quarter of a million compounds. And as we published last year in Science, we got very lucky because we found this molecule. And it turns out to be an extraordinarily good inhibitor of PGDH enzyme activity. It, it's potent at a level of 10 to the minus 10th molar, so vanishingly small amounts. It binds incredibly tightly to the protein, so tightly that you can't compete it off with PGE2. Not only does it inhibit PGDH enzyme in a test tube, but if you put it on top of cells, it inhibits PGDH enzyme in those cells. And when you ask what happens to cells that have been treated with this drug, PGE2 increases quite markedly. Not only does it work in cells in the laboratory, but it works in mice. So here is the regular mouse and the mouse that's lacking PGDH. And you can see that in multiple tissues that we examined in the mouse, PGE2 accumulates. It roughly doubles. And here now is the normal mouse that we've given the drug to. And three hours after we've given the drug, in each of these different tissues, the marrow, the colon, the lung, PGE2 has accumulated and reached the same level as we see in the genetic model where the mouse has no PGDH whatsoever. 
the drug can also confer the same protection to the mouse that the genetic knockout does. Here is the mouse with colitis. Here was the protection from ulceration of the mouse that genetically lacks PGDH. And you can see the same protection in a mouse given 5 milligrams of our drug or given 10 milligrams of the drug. There's no ulceration. The same thing is true clinically. Give the, the control mouse DSS, it loses weight and gets sick. Give that mouse 10 milligrams of the drug and it gains weight and is healthy. And the same thing is true of diarrhea. I won't go through all of the data. This also works in the liver. If you cut out the liver and then measure its regrowth, you can see in the blue bars the regeneration of a mouse getting control. And here in red bars, twice as fast the regeneration of the mouse getting the PGDH inhibitor drug. And it's being driven exactly as you would expect. If you look for proliferating cells in the liver by staining for BRDU, give this PGDH inhibitor and you double the number of proliferating cells. With the drug, we could also ask a question we couldn't easily ask in the mouse, which was, what about outside of the gut? And we looked outside of the gut in a model of bone marrow transplantation. So here is a mouse that gets a lethal dose of radiation, and then it gets a bone marrow transplant, and we give it either the PGDH inhibitor drug or nothing. And we don't give a very large bone marrow transplant. We don't give enough cells to rescue the mouse. And because we haven't given enough cells, the control mice all die 12 days after the transplant. But the mice that got the PGDH inhibitor are all alive. And if you ask what is happening, what you see is that in mice that get the PGDH inhibitor, the neutrophils come back seven days faster. The platelets never get as low. The red count never gets as low. And as you would expect, when you're seeing more neutrophils, more platelets, more red cells, the reason for all of this is that the number of stem cells in the marrow after the transplant are much greater in the mouse that got the drug. So we keep seeing in each different tissue the same theme. Inhibit PGDH, get more stem cells, get faster tissue regeneration after damage. I'll skip all of the details of how it works, but we did work out the mechanism of how all of this works. And it's shown here in this cartoon. Normally, oncogenes, COX-1 and COX-2, make PGE2. But they're held in check by this break, which is 15 PGDH. When you give a drug that inhibits PGDH, now there's no break. PGE2 accumulates. Now, in the bone marrow, that turns on a number of hematopoietic cytokines, stem cell factor, CXCL12. Those draw the transplant into the bone marrow, and then they help that transplant mature to make more neutrophils, red cells, and platelets. The same idea works both in the liver and in the colon. The details of the cytokines are different, but the underlying architecture, whereby the increase in PGE2 makes more stem cells, shown here in green, allowing the liver to repair faster or the colon to repair ulcers faster, is conserved across all of the tissues. So we believe that there are opportunities to bring this forward clinically as treatment for ulcerative colitis, in surgery after resection of primary or metastatic tumors to the liver, and also in support of patients undergoing stem cell transplants. So we look at PGDH as a switch. Normally, you'd probably like that switch to be on. because it means your stem cells will proliferate slower, your risk of cancer will be low, lower, but you'll pay a price. You'll have slower tissue repair. But there are some situations where you'd like PGDH to be turned off for a little while. That's when you've just been injured. And now you would like to turn it off so that your stem cells will proliferate faster. You won't have much cancer risk because, as I told you, the effects of aspirin on cancer take 10 years to develop. So we think that turning off PGDH for a couple of weeks is perfectly safe, and indeed that's what our mice tell us. And we've developed a drug now, PGDH, that can do that. 
So this is what I've told you. This is from a review that I wrote a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here you see all of the genes that are involved in driving colons to go from being normal to being malignant. This is called a Vogelgram. We started with an observation that defects in mismatch repair can start this fuse, this molecular fuse, to develop cancer. That led us to discover that DNA methylation of MLH1 can cause the same problem. And that led us to discover that TGF-beta receptors and the TGF-beta pathway are key suppressors of colon cancer. And that ultimately led us to discover that the way TGDH is work, the way TGF-beta is working is by turning on TGDH to block the inflammatory effects of COX-2. Um, I didn't do this work, but my lab does, and this is all of their pictures with the names of all of the folks who have contributed to this work. Also, our collaborators at UT Southwestern with whom we found this PGDH inhibitor drug. Our collaborators at Harvard with whom we did the work on aspirin. And of course, our longtime friends and collaborators in the Vogelstein Laboratory. Thank you very much.